welcome Anthony Mint and Karen Lebowitz, who are husband and wife co-founders of The Perennial. This is an award-winning San Francisco restaurant and bar dedicated to making food the delicious solution to climate change. And when I say award-winning, I mean best new restaurants in America, 25 most daring companies in America, best bars in America, best cocktails in San Francisco, most sustainable from... And they've been awarded from places like Bon Appetit, Food and Wine, San Francisco Magazine, 20 Most Important Restaurants in America, and a Michelin star. Pretty big deal. So let me tell you a little bit more about them. Anthony and Karen co-authored the memoir cookbook Mission Street Food, Recipes and Ideas from an Improbable Restaurant back in 2011. They often work together, though Anthony is primarily a restaurateur whose projects include Mission Chinese Food, Commonwealth, and Mission Cantina. And Karen is primarily a food writer who has written for Lucky Peach, Food and Wine, and the New York Times, among other publications. She's also the co-author with Dominique Crenn of Atelier Crenn, Metamorphosis of Taste. She's the director of communications for the and although Anthony doesn't have an official title, he's responsible for dreaming up all the weird environmental projects. I'm going to let them get started. Welcome. Well, thanks so much. Um, thanks for having us. Um, I am Karen Lebowitz. This is Anthony Mint. The other title we've come up with for him is Problem Solver, Problem Creator. Um, so the, the perennial is unusual in um, the restaurant world in that it's very mission driven. Um, we see it as an opportunity to engage people in the idea of transforming the food system um, through a kind of environmentalism without compromise. Um, so, um, so here are some pictures of the perennial, the, um, the bread, which actually we brought for you today, um, which is made from a perennial grain. So uh, we'll talk more about why that's important, but basically it's part of our larger project of combating climate change through food. Um, there's our bar and cocktails and uh, beef tartare, and we'll talk about why meat is actually not off the menu at the perennial. Um, <clears throat> so I think quick, we'll just do kind of a background. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Julia. And you know, I, just to clarify one thing, because uh, sometimes restaurants are touchy about accolades and things. Uh, so we helped open a restaurant called Commonwealth. Commonwealth has a Michelin star, and so not the perennial though. We're we're hoping someday. Um, but so we have uh, somewhat humble origins in the background, or in the restaurant industry, uh, which, as Yulia mentioned, are kind of documented in this book, Mission Street Food. Um, and so it was in 2008 when we basically kind of got started. And the, you know, if you think back to that time, there were not really gourmet food trucks or pop-up restaurants. Uh, it was the recession, and people were looking for interesting you know, dining experiences kind of on a budget, and Twitter had just opened or started, but we didn't really use Twitter or understand any of that stuff. Um, and we sublet a Guatemalan snack cart on a Thursday night, and then basically tried to serve gourmet tacos from it. And we never really thought that that would be successful. We just were doing it kind of for fun. Uh, the internet being as such, <laughs> things kind of snowballed, and a friend of ours wrote a blog about it, and then uh, local food press, eater.com, wrote a story about it. I think the headline called me a highfalutin line cook. Um, and so we, you know, we, I was standing on the street corner waiting for the truck to show up, and I had a cooler with a bunch of mise en place and different stuff, and there was another guy standing on the corner also, like looking at his phone, and I asked him, like, hey, are you here for something? And he said, you know, yeah, I'm here for the food truck. And so we had, you know, people waiting for the truck before I had even set foot in the truck for the first time. Um, and then Karen was rushing back. Uh, she was a grad student in Berkeley at the time and, you know, ran back and we were scrambling around and didn't really know what we were doing. Um, and so we did that for a few weeks and then moved into uh, basically a crappy all on the wall Chinese restaurant, which is now the um, home of Mission Chinese Food. And, you know, we did pop-up events uh, once a week at first, and then eventually twice a week. And we invited 
guest chefs and line cooks from around the city to come do half the menu, and we did the other half. And again, we never really expected it to last for very long or be you know, leading to anything, and so we uh, gave all the profits away to charity, and that was a fun way to kind of be part of a bigger you know, San Francisco community. Um, and so uh, eventually we kind of decided, like, you know, why are we making things really hard and serving, you know, Mexiterranean food one night and like a whole hog dinner and using the wok with charcoal in it and grilling octopus and stuff. You know, why don't we just use the woks as woks? And so we worked with someone who was a guest chef, uh, a Korean adoptee from Oklahoma named Danny Bowen, uh, who at the time I think, you know, was a line cook and... Only wearing shorts. Swim trunks, I think, yeah. every day. <laughs> um, and so we started Mission Chinese, and you know, we decided at some point, let's, or went from the get-go with that one, like, let's not rotate the charities all the time. Let's just give 75 cents from each entree to the food bank. And you know, it was a kind of random seeming project that, again, I don't think that we necessarily thought we'll be doing this forever. Uh, and then eventually, it became really successful. Danny moved to New York and also opened there when he opened in New York. Uh, the restaurant won New York Times Restaurant of the Year in 2012, despite being uh, located inside of a Thai takeout counter. <laughs> um, and so since then, we've uh, raised over a million meals for the San Francisco Food Bank. And so I think this speaks towards kind of the possibilities in the restaurant industry of you know uh, finding a project that resonates with the public. Yeah, so the same summer that we opened Mission Chinese Food, uh, 2010, we also worked with some former co-workers of Anthony's to open a restaurant called Commonwealth, which was more of the fine dining version of this. But I think in both cases, we were interested in seeing how food and restaurants can be used to convey meaning. Um, so we were creating a kind of link with the food bank and, and asking people to think more about food broadly, not just um, what was delicious, though it should be delicious, but also sort of what food means to us, and as a way to make connections. Um, so from there, we wrote the book, Mission Street Food, and um, talked about uh, that journey and even gave a Google talk. Um, and then <clears throat> in 2012, we had a baby um, who is now a kid. Um, but uh, I feel like that really focused us on issues of the future and thinking about especially climate change. Um, and we were uh, dismayed to learn that by some accounts, the food system is responsible for up to 50% of the um, greenhouse gas emissions in the world. And we, you know, as people working with food, we felt like, what can we do better? And so we started trying to improve operations at Mission Chinese and Commonwealth. But we started to think, what would happen if you really started um, a restaurant with the idea of climate change in mind? And that's where the perennial began. Um, yeah, so as Karen mentioned, <clears throat> I feel like as, as we were researching it just seemed completely undeniable that food is a really big part of climate change. And you know, I think something that we realized also along the way is that uh, the restaurant sector is almost as big as the entire agriculture sector. Um, and there was a lot of potential to, again, use the restaurant sector to try to change the food system. Um, you can kind of see on this line graph, or first I should say, we don't get into any of this kind of stuff at the perennial. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is just for, you know, um, this kind of form. talk. Yeah, the, <laughs> um, but so there's a line chart here that shows atmospheric greenhouse gases. And of course, there's other things, industrialization going on. But you can see like really big inflection points um, around the invention of the plow and the advent of chemical fertilizer. Uh, and, you know, this is an image from the Dust Bowl. Um, I think even as food professionals, we really, you know, several years ago could not have told you like what constitutes good farming. Like we understood oh, organic and local, these are important things, or, uh, but I don't think we actually understood <clears throat> farming. And I think that a lot of, uh, for that, that kind of makes sense. Like a lot of us have grown up in a generation, you know, of industrial agriculture and pretty disconnected from food. Um, 
in this era, there was also fake news. I guess that's sort of like pertinent these days. And you know, they the railroad companies had a pitch like the plows follow the rain, and people you know rushed out west to claim land, dug up perennial grasses that used to live in these ecosystems, and then started row crop farming. Eventually realized you can't do that. The environment's too dry. You know, if there's no rain six months of the year, this doesn't make sense. This led to what is called the Dust Bowl. Dust from Oklahoma is like flying through the air and landing in Washington, D.C., and it kind of had to go that far before the government created uh, like a, an agency to work on soil. Um, you know, so on the one hand, that is pretty negative, but on the other hand, it speaks towards the potential to just radically change the whole food system and farming really quickly in response to um, that kind of problem. Um, so again, this is not actually what we talk about at the perennial at all, because you know we got into the project with a kind of, um, I think, normal standard orientation to environmentalism, that it's all about conservation or doing less bad. But as we got into it, what we discovered was actually agriculture has the capacity to really repair the damage of uh, climate change because plants draw down CO2, um, can store carbon in the soil. Um, and so we, we started to really think about the power, especially of perennial plants, to restore the soil and um, reverse climate change. And so we were really excited because it felt like we had this optimistic message. And it's not just do less, like eat less, do, you know, whatever, but really a, a message of a positive action. Um, so. So that was exciting for us. And, and through that research, we discovered that there are all these um, new efforts to make um, perennials really part of the climate change solution. So here's an example um, of a plant that's just recently been um, released um, and approved for human consumption. It's called Kernza. It was developed by the Land Institute in Kansas. And you can see on the top, there's wheat. And on the bottom, there's Kernza. And Anthony can't even reach all the way to the end of it. This is, um, I think, a little more down, too. Um, so you can see the, the roots are uh, not only longer, but also thicker and more complex. And they become the environment for all sorts of um, life. Uh, microorganisms and worms that also are working on making the soil um, more of a carbon sink. Um, so that's um, that's the grain that we're using in the bread um, that you're eating. Let's just drop it. Okay. And um, and uh, that has been an exciting thing for us. We're the first restaurant um, to be making our our bread from Kernza. It's not 100% Kernza. It's a mix. Um, but it. Uh, so the Land Institute has been naturally breeding this grain for the last 15 years in conjunction with the University of Minnesota. And it represents basically like a radical shift in agriculture back to perennial polycultures. And so, again, with the Dust Bowl and stuff, the, the prairies used to be covered with plants like Kernza, perennial grasses that evolved in that ecosystem. Uh, we plowed it up to plant plants like wheat, which you can see on the poster, just have much smaller root systems. Uh, all the root systems represent themselves, you know, carbon in the atmosphere that can be back in the soil. And as Karen mentioned, also a whole uh, ecosystem of microbiology called the rhizosphere that surrounds the roots. Um, and so, you know, the Land Institute embarked on this journey to basically take agriculture back to to that kind of uh, kind of working with natural systems instead of working with fertilizer and extracting from the soil, um, and so Kernza is a hybrid between perennial wheatgrass and wheat, and it's basically in like version 1.0 now. So you can get it uh, at the perennial as bread. Uh, it's also available commercially on the West Coast at Whole Foods as beer, um, called Long Root Ale, and that was pioneered by uh, the company Patagonia in their food line, Patagonia Provisions. 
you can see there's meat there. Um, I think that there is a kind of uh, prevailing belief that meat is the worst thing that you can do for the environment. One of the things that we learned is there are ways of managing animals that promote perennial grasses um, and can actually be climate beneficial. So I'm going to um, show you a little video. It's very short. We made this for um, an event at the Asian Art Museum. So at the Perennial, we've been serving meat from a ranch that follows this um, protocol. It's called Stemple Creek. Um, and we've also been purchasing the animal in large cuts so that um, we find a place for all the parts. Um, and so we have a dining room and a bar, and we can you know, have different kinds of uh, cuts for different applications, um, and you know, also trying to think about meat as not the centerpiece of um, the meal. So all of those together, um, and I think one of the things is putting such a focus on soil and the capacity for soil to be a carbon sink means that uh, we also are recognizing that it doesn't make sense to, for example, grow herbs in soil, which are never going to really rebuild the soil. So um, we have another project where we're taking food waste from the perennial and using it to power a greenhouse, which um, is just right across the bridge in Oakland, um, and kind of frees up land for more perennial kinds of um, crops. But um, just to walk you through it, and I should mention that the illustration on the left was um, by the local artist, uh, Wendy McNaughton, um, and the one on the right is by John Adams, who um, also worked with us on that video. Um, so we take the food scraps. I mean, even if you're really conscientious about food waste, there's still certain things like, you know, onion peels. Um, and that goes to um, our worm bin. Worms are fed to fish. The fish fertilize water, which is used partly to um, irrigate our raised beds, but also in a system which is like hydroponics, but where instead of using chemical fertilizer, the the nutrition is coming from uh, essentially fish poop. Um, and then so we can grow kind of specialty herbs and lettuces, um, which are then served at the perennial. Uh, one thing that really got us excited about aquaponics was <clears throat> learning about a facility in Minneapolis that is in the former Ham's Brewing Company. And so it's a six level facility and they're producing on one level, kind of using all the plumbing from the brewery that was pre-existing and they're doing aquaponics. And as demand for the products increase, uh, they project that they will be able to produce 700,000 pounds of lettuce and 150,000 pounds of fish per year. So that completely blew my mind. <laughs> and you know, I think it, uh, we also read some stats where I think at the end of World War II, something like 40% of the produce in America was grown in people's gardens. It was called a victory garden. Um, and so, you know, as Karen mentioned, it just seems insane to be like growing 
herbs and lettuces in the field and then throwing it in a clamshell container and shipping it across the country when you could just be growing that in the city and it would be fresher and a way to use food waste in places that don't compost. I think one thing that we had not completely understood before this project was the ways in which uh, soil health uh, interacted with nutrition um, and the ways in which kind of there's a lot of externalities in the food system and you know you're kind of paying for like government subsidies and different things. Uh, this is just a little you know snippet from a book that shows some of the nutrient differences between a USDA approved egg and like a pastured egg from a well-known farm called Polyface in Virginia. And you know some of the differences are like really surprising in it's like orders of magnitude difference in terms of nutrient density. Um, and the book goes on to kind of mention like a USDA approved egg doesn't have anything to do with like growing practices, nutrition, literally anything. The only thing is the size is the right size and that it's not broken. Um, so it could be like covered with salmonella or whatever that the USDA doesn't care. You know, meanwhile, polyface farms can't even sell at a grocery store because it's not big enough to kind of uh, qualify for the USDA stuff. So these are some of the challenges to small farmers and things that, you know, again, it's sort of like we don't really want to talk about it at the dinner table, but lead to some of the problems in the food system. And in a lot of ways, like climate change is a, is a good way to rally people to support good farming. Um, so then really quick, also about nutrition. Um, there's like a prevailing notion that <clears throat> the human body is absorbing nutrients primarily driven by how microbiology interacts with and breaks down uh, food in the gut. And you know, it's like you can't just eat a bunch of vitamins. Like you need to eat food that has nutrients and then the microbiology in your gut kind of makes it bioavailable to you. Uh, and then something that also completely surprised us was that, uh, though it makes perfect sense, uh, that plant roots are basically like an inverted gut you know, serving as like a home for all the microbiology that break down the nutrients in the soil and then provide that to the plant and make the plant healthy. Um, so you can see there's like a, some little stats about how there's significant, uh, significantly lower nutrient density in a lot of food uh, in the U.S. as a result of degraded soil. We're specifically kind of facing every day as sort of dealing with consumers and talking about these issues but trying to find a way to do it that takes like two seconds, you know, instead of like 30 minutes because no one wants to hear this talk at the dinner table or anything like that. Um, and I feel like, you know, even for us prior to getting into this project, you know, that like there's a picture here of farmer's market tomatoes, organic tomatoes at the supermarket and conventional tomatoes. And it's sort of like, I really had no idea what the difference was. If, if someone asked me to like articulate it, I would have had a hard time articulating it. And, you know, the certified organic can mean the farmer's doing really great stuff, or it can mean they're just not using things that are not approved on the approved list. You know, And so, in a way, it's sort of like there's actually a whole lot more to farming that is basically like beyond organic, uh, but how do we educate people about this topic or whatever, or even really understand it? Um, and so one thing that the restaurant is embarking on as kind of a project in conjunction with a lot of different sustainable food organizations is making a little guide uh, kind of the equivalent of the Monterey Bay Seafood Guide, maybe. Um, and apparently there is a metric that farmers measure called soil organic matter. And it's just part of the basic soil test, like pH, nitrogen, you know, phosphorus, whatever levels. And then they just have a percent soil organic matter. Um, and so we're trying to work with a lot of farmers and chefs to make this kind of a bigger movement to recognize healthy soil um, using that as a proxy for a lot of good practices. And so it's a little bit of an oversimplification because it varies a little bit from region to region. You, you know, you could also be like a great farmer who just took over degraded land and you're bringing it up or different things. But in a lot of ways, uh, those are sort of like the exceptions to the rule. And like in a broader way, um, we're hoping that this can kind of steer the conversation in the right direction of focus towards healthy soil. Um, so 
just to bring it back, we are also running a restaurant and, you know, not generally giving a slideshow <laughs> um, at the restaurant. And what we really want is for the food to be a kind of entry point to these discussions and the space to be a place for conversation. And um, the way we've done it is is really to try to be relatively low key about it and let um, people's questions guide the conversation. Um, and we also think that if it's not delicious, then no one will follow suit. So that is still a, a very serious uh, project as well. Um, so all in all, you know, our life work is really to uh, think about food, which is one of the things that every one of us has in common um, as a way to connect with, you know, something bigger than ourselves um, and uh, even creating a better world for the, you know, the future. So um, there's a lot of different projects that we're happy to talk about in the question period. Um, but I think, um, yeah, we're, these are some books also that we have found um, influential um, for our thinking about it and that we recommend. Um, but that's, that's our spiel. <laughs> Um, so I have a couple questions for you guys, um, and I'm, I know these guys will have some questions as well. Um, why, uh, why a restaurant as your form of activism? Why not run for Congress? Um, <laughs> well, don't put it past us. Um, I think you heard it here first. <laughs> one thing is we have experience in restaurants, and you know we. Um, felt like that was something that drew on our expertise. Um, so once you sort of get the passion for environmentalism, it makes sense to sort of start where you are. And I think many different fields could do that. But I think food is particularly situated for that because of the, um, the impact that food has on the environment and the capacity to reverse climate change. But then the last piece is restaurants are... Um, interestingly influential in our culture. Like if you think about when you were kids, there was almost certainly not an organic section in your supermarket. And the reason that we have it can pretty much be traced back to Chez Panisse. You know, that um, one restaurant started talking about where the food came from and it really did change the conversation around food. And now, you know, Walmart is stocking organic. Sure, I think also the, <clears throat> you know, the way that information travels now and trends move in the food industry. Uh, you know, the chef at the best restaurant in the world is foraging in 2010, and then in 2011, we're foraging in San Francisco, and in 2012, we're already over foraging in 2000, you know, and so uh, I, think, I think it would be really exciting to be part of that movement in the restaurant industry, too, and, and that it's possible. So you guys are trendsetters for sure. Um, so kind of follow-up questions with that. Um, you said that, you know, your your activism is subtle in the restaurant. It's not something that you're, you know, beating people over their heads with. Can you share a little bit more about what that experience might be like when you visit the restaurant? And also, double question, what <laughs> kinds of people are you, what kind of clientele are you attracting? Do you feel like you're ever kind of preaching to the choir? Or are you hoping to reach out to more than just the people in the know? Um... Well, second question first. Um, I think there's a really wide range. You know, so I was talking with a server who said that he often, you know, will be delivering the third course and someone will say, is there a theme here? You know, because he's just sort of like, let them have their date or whatever and like really tried not to impose the message. Um, and other people come in and they're like, I have seven questions, you know, should we do them before I order or after, you know, they're like uh, really engaged. And so, you know, our goal is to be kind of useful and, you know, move the conversation for all of those people. And actually, um, excitingly, lately we've had a, an influx of people who are going to see Hamilton around the corner from the restaurant. And so they... Um, might not have as much time because they got to make the curtain, but um, it's a whole range of people who um, are not necessarily coming for the environmentalism, but you know it becomes part of the whole experience. You know, it's um, a night out where you, like all kinds of synapses are firing. Um, 
I think also we've sort of started to gain uh, like a reputation in the sustainable food movement as a gathering place, and so we have a lot of events. And you know, I was talking with people who were working on a food waste dinner, and we were talking. You know, I was making the rounds, and then they were. They like look behind them and they were like, I think that's our cricket farmer behind, you know. And so like it's just a, um, it sort of feels a little bit like the, you know, the bar across from City Hall where the lawyers go and make the deals. And so it's kind of fun to be part of that too, just in a physical way. Yeah, I mean, so speaking of the bar, I think that can be, you know, one way to uh, engage with it, like. Uh, the straws that we use are not made from plastic. They're made from straw. And so people, you know, at first they're sort of like, this is not what I'm used to, you know, and we'll really have a lot of questions about it. And the bartenders are like, yeah, you know, you can have seven of them if you want because they're all compostable. You know, it's totally natural. And, and actually, plastic straws are incredibly wasteful in most bars. The bartenders use a couple to stir and test and then throw them away. And, you know, we have none of that. And so some of that stuff, you just sort of like, it's like chatting with the bartender, you know. Awesome. So the Salon for Sustainability is the hope. Which <laughs> I like that. A um, couple, que- couple more questions for you guys. Um, you, I'm sure you're hoping that the perennial can be a model for other restaurants. And do you know of any other restaurants that are doing similar work? How do you partner with them, if so? Um, well, there's two really great examples. Uh, one is a restaurant in upstate New York called Blue Hill at Stone Barns. And the chef there probably is <clears throat> more than anyone responsible for, you know, kind of spearheading like what, what you might call farm to table 2.0. And he's working with breeders to basically breed like heirloom varieties of wheat or breed and you know cross of squash that is more flavorful or whatever. So you know, kind of doing more than shopping for sure. Uh, and then the other is a restaurant in uh, Brighton in the UK called Silo, and they're a no waste restaurant, zero waste. And so they have. Big Bertha, like their composter is like front and center, and they're growing mushrooms from the coffee grounds. And if you know the purveyors bring produce in plastic bags, then there's a local artisan who melts them down and makes plates with them and different stuff. And so we really admire, you know, all these efforts that everyone's doing. Uh, that you know we happen to be located in the middle of the city, so I think what Dan Parber's doing at Blue Hill is not available to us because they're located on a farm. And then yeah, silo, I feel like zero waste is amazing, and we're trying to just focus on climate change. Yeah, but in terms of partnering, um, we definitely talk with them and share ideas, and that is something that's really um, fun, that when you have a, a mission-driven business, uh, there's more of a collaborative orientation. So like we chat with the folks from silo, the um, people uh, from Blue Hill at Stone Barns had a book party with us last week, and you know it was just there's sort of a sense of a movement, um, at, at which I think we're at the beginning of. But it's exciting to kind of make those connections. Absolutely. Speaking of movements, I know we're all looking for a uh, farm table 2.0, like the new name, because you know we might be over that particular name. We might be saying that too much. So if you've got a good idea for us, let us know. I have one last question. I'm going to open it up to these guys. Um, the parent in me really wants to know: Do you have a picky eater? Um, yes and no. We have a <laughs> we have an almost five year old who, uh, you know, eats vegetables that are not leaves. So broccoli, string beans. Oh, <laughs> she, she eats lettuce now. Sometimes, yeah. Nice. Um, but, but, uh, but she definitely probably prefers like plain pasta <laughs> yeah. to pasta with <laughs> herb sauce. Yep. Yeah, I had a moment with her in a grocery store where she went to the cheese counter and she said, I'm looking for some fancy cheese with no flavor. <laughs> and I was like, that is very accurate. That is what she wants. <laughs> Do you feel like your five-year-old is growing up knowing words like sustainability and organic and local and things like that? Is this the new generation? Well, she just recently learned about global warming. Oh and, um, from a kid's book. From a from kid's us. book. Um, I know I had sort of been trying to protect her from that. Um, but we know we talk a lot about the work that worms do. And um, we try to get her you know, into gardening and, um, and seeing the kind of 
power and excitement of um, making food, growing it, cooking it, serving it, all of it, uh, actually giving it away, like going to food pantries, things like that. Um, and she's definitely food oriented for sure. Um, but she also has some ideas about global warming. Like she asked me if she could throw ice cubes out the back door. She was like, I'm trying to cool it down. <laughs> so uh, that was hard to explain. <laughs> I love that. So you guys are pioneers and superheroes, which I love. I'm going to open it up to these guys for questions. and we'll... So in case you can't hear, are some of the events that you talked about public? And if so, how do we get involved? For sure. Well, we have an Earth Day celebration coming up. Um, and um, we do probably once or twice a month public events. Um, you can follow us on social media, and uh, we have a newsletter also. Um, and actually, do you want to explain the Earth Day plan? Sure. Um, so we're lucky enough to have met someone who works at the San Francisco Department of the Environment uh, named Donnie Olvera. And so he's going to come and talk about the city's plans, which are completely amazing. I don't know if I'm allowed to say the specifics, but the city has a goal of uh, zero waste by 2020. Fifty percent is ticking. Fifty <laughs> percent of trips, uh, not like fifty percent of passenger trips, not made by cars, and then one hundred percent renewable energy. So, you can hear more details about those and drink uh, beer made from Kernza. And I think he has promised, though I'm waiting for confirmation, but he's promised that he'll be bringing uh, his bike-powered margarita. Set up. So. Yeah, and then we're also doing, um, an, we're sort of starting a series of events with winemakers um, because we have, you know, kind of incredible uh, winemakers nearby who, many of them are really engaging with sustainable um, agricultural practices. The first uh, wine tasting that we're doing um, with a winemaker is on April, sorry, March 25th, and then we're doing also like a week later. You can just like hang out in the bar and drink wine and chat with him. He'll just be around to talk about, um, you know, what difference does it make if your wine cellar is actually a cellar or if it's above ground. There's actually a huge difference in the energy use. Um, things like that. Um, so sort of at different levels of dorkiness. Like actually Anthony mentioned the, um, <laughs> the city of San Francisco guy, but he did not mention the bike powered, um, is it? Margaritas. margaritas. Yeah. So like getting the uh, slushy margarita with your own uh, bike power um, for Earth Day. Um, and I think Mother Jones is having a, a party on April 12th. I will need to check on that date. <laughs> but um, just like to talk, their food team is going to have a public event in our bar. So I'm excited for that. Tell us more about Zero Food Print. Sure. Um, so Zero Food Print actually predated the perennial. Um, I was part of starting that with a friend named Chris Ying and an environmental expert named Peter Fried. And Chris Ying used to be the editor of Lucky Peach magazine. And I think the goal was basically to learn about how restaurants are part of climate change. And you know, I think it started with an initial question, like, are restaurants really bad? How does it compare to a home-cooked meal? Um, so they did a life cycle analysis, kind of learned that it's not that bad, uh, pretty comparable to a home-cooked meal for various reasons. And then from there sort of realized that restaurants can make small changes that make a big difference. Most people are kind of too focused on the day-to-day, -to -day, like, is my dishwasher going to show up today? Or you know, is, is my meat order going to come or whatever? Um, but then over the course of it, I think we learned a lot of things like, you know, the and the carbon footprint of feedlot beef is so high that, you know, serving fried chicken instead could be an environmental act, um, or just different ways. I think a lot of people understand things like, you know, the amount of calories in butter versus celery, but a lot of people don't really understand kind of like the carbon footprint of cheese versus tomatoes is also like orders of magnitude different. Um, and chefs and restaurateurs especially. So I think part of it was to kind of educate chefs and restaurateurs, let them do make the changes that were easy to make, and then give them a way to participate in a food-related carbon offset program. Um, so like a small share of a methane digester on a dairy farm 
um, you know, because a restaurant is ultimately going to have some carbon footprint because they're serving food and doing stuff, you know, but then they can kind of uh, facilitate positive work somewhere else in the food system uh, and then basically qualify as being zero footprint or carbon neutral. Um, so in a lot of ways, that's like a top-down approach that any restaurant can adopt. So just to clarify the kind of relationship among our projects, um, we have the Perennial, which is a restaurant that's really dedicated to the idea that food can be regenerative, right? So one of the terms that we use instead of farm to table 2.0 is regenerative agriculture. But um, we have the, the restaurant that's sort of like consumer facing. Um, and then we have a nonprofit called Zero Food Print, which is really chef facing and saying, you know, here's how to assess your footprint, uh, improve your footprint and offset your footprint. And then we have another nonprofit as well, which is farm facing, which is about um, sharing information about uh, soil health and um, best practices and things like that. And so the whole um, you know suite of activities is really about saying, hey, uh, there's only one thing that we know right now that can uh, draw down greenhouse gases. Like, let's get on that, you know. And so wh whoever you are, wherever you are within the food system, like here's how you can engage. What kind um, of adoption have you had with zero food print? Uh, so this past year, we have started working with about 20 restaurants. And we would gladly welcome any sort of larger institutional partnerships. Uh, I think sort of at a larger institutional level, Google, for example, probably has like a director of sustainability. And they could probably do their own research and find their own offsets or like buy a whole digester as their own program. You know, they, they wouldn't necessarily need like a slice of a pie that of a project that someone else is funding entirely. Uh, but we would love to work with any organizations that would want to work with us. Yeah, so Zero Food Print has been expanding, um, you know, and working with restaurant groups, um, which is interesting because you can sort of compare and contrast within a group. Um, but we're really interested also in getting into um, groceries and you know thinking about all the different ways that uh, people access food. Um, yeah, and there is a um, someone who we've worked with, uh, kind of like consulting on food and carbon footprint data, uh, is this author who wrote one of the books on the screen, uh, "How Bad Are Bananas," and. It's basically like the carbon footprint of you know a dozen eggs or an email or your mortgage or driving across town, and he has done a whole life cycle analysis or assessment for uh, a UK grocery chain called Tesco, and so like one of their stores is like carbon neutral. Krista's excellent question was, where do we get more of the good stuff, the Krinza? Yeah, um, I think that the Land Institute is rapidly expanding um, production, but uh, it is really early days for um, Krinza. Is that where yours comes from? Come we, Kansas, so there's farmers growing Krinza in Illinois, Kansas, and Minnesota, kind of like the grain belt. and. So it sort of wants a winter vernalization period to grow best. And since it's kind of in the ramping up stage, it makes the most sense to kind of grow it in the place where it grows best. Uh, I should also say we don't 100% know all the answers because they're kind of like changing. But um, our understanding most recently is that uh, the way that it integrates with machinery um, for processing and milling and stuff, it is most like spelt. And they, you know, they use a spelt dehuller, but sometimes there's a little bit of hull left on it, and so that is like a little bit labor intensive to get it, you know, perfect for bread making and stuff. So it's going to be commercially available as flour in 2019, and it's available as beer immediately because you can make beer even if there's a little bit of hull. Um, so that's like a widespread commercial project and they anticipate based on kind of like the arc of how the natural breeding is going that they'll be ready with flour in a couple of years. And so it is pretty early, but by the same token, like a week or two ago, uh, General Mills signed a deal with, or I, I don't know if that's the right term, but is like on committed. board, yeah, committed to support the project. And so, you know, I, I don't know the specifics of that, but I think it involves like guaranteeing farmers contracts to like start incorporating it into 
the Cascadian Farms line or whatever that is of General Mills, and then also a $500,000 grant to the University of Minnesota to continue research on it. And then, you know, so again, this, this is like happening now or available now or soon, and then 10 or 20 years from now, they expect to also be providing like perennial wheat and people in China are working on perennial rice. And so I feel like it's the very beginning of like the shift of agriculture back to, you know, natural systems. I guess I would sum that question up as tell us more about what you're doing to get mainstream adoption and are you limited by things like scale in the restaurant? Yeah. Um, so we are working with this ranch, Temple Creek Ranch, in part because they are one of the pilot ranches with an organization called the Marin Carbon Project. And so we're really lucky to have kind of stumbled onto it because they just are an hour from here. Uh, and we visited the ranch, and when we got there, the, one of the founders was, you know, sitting in a parking lot, windy parking lot at the top of the hill with a whiteboard talking to you know, inspectors from the United Nations and kind of starting the process of making carbon farming uh, like a recognized federal subsidized type of activity, um, like measuring the amount of carbon and then starting to divert money to subsidize that kind of farming. And so there's actually many different ranches in our area that are working on carbon ranching. Um, Tomcat Ranch and their beef brand, which is called Left Coast Grass-Fed. Uh, there's one called Holistic Ag Beef and uh, Picenus Ranch and True Grass Farm. So there's a lot of different people who are independently doing carbon farming and you know, there's people in South Dakota and Montana and like all over the US who are kind of doing it just because it's like better yield anyway. So it just makes sense anyway. Uh, the breakthrough from the Marine Carbon Project is that they apply compost to the field at the beginning, and that sort of jump starts the process. And also, contrary to what scientists would expect, actually leads to durable soil carbon that will last for like 30 to 100 years, or like continue to be sequestered for 30 to 100 years just from one application and then properly managed grazing. Um, so, in a lot of ways, that is like even more surprising how fast and optimistic the messages uh, but so the marine carbon project has three pilot ranches now and it's going to be like you know 20 within a couple years and their work is basically to work with ranchers and create specific plans for that ranch that's like you know plant trees here do this for this part of the ranch like divert the pond here so you can irrigate whatever and like the whole thing has like a certain uh, amount of like scientific rigor and peer-reviewed uh, carbon sequestration assigned to like each action for each area and then they can take that you know carbon farm plan of like you know we're gonna sequester 10,000 tons over whatever time period to the government and get money for to start implementing that plan um, so I think it will be scaling up and then you know California has um been working on how to apply the um, carbon t tax that we've had. Um, so uh, there's the question of you know how to reward people who are doing this kind of work. And so we've been a little bit involved in um, lobbying Sacramento for um, healthy soil initiative to um, promote to say people in the city also care about agricultural issues. So I think all in all, we, we feel that it is very scalable and um, we're sort of coming at it from the direction of building consumer demand, um, talking to the farmers that we know and connecting them with resources like the Marine Carbon Project, and then also working on it like from a political angle. But I think also if you think back to like 10 years ago, you know, I, I didn't spend the extra dollars on grass-fed beef and it wasn't kind of like as ubiquitous and now it's kind of all over the place and people are more used to spending that extra dollar and so in a lot of ways we're just trying to you know I hate to keep doing this but kind of kickstart like grass-fed 2.0 where it's like cows are part of the climate change solution unless they're feedlot cows then that's part of the problem but super bad so I think the question um, is, grass-fed beef is more expensive. Um, do you feel like the Bay Area can sustain that? And if not, um, 
And then are other restaurants um, going to be implementing the true cost of food in the future? Yeah, and I think your question also is beyond the beef itself, but just like, is sustainable food um, going to work as a sustainable business model? Um, and, you know, I think that is like the big experiment um, that we've embarked on. And um, the Bay Area obviously is a, a kind of prime place to try it out. You know, I think the bigger question is, could people do that outside of the Bay Area? Um, but, you know, Anthony and I were just talking this morning about um, kind of the perception of value in um, food in America. So I had read that um, in 1930, um, the average American household spent 25% of its income on food. In 1950, that percentage was 30%. It had gone up. And that it's now, in the thing I read, it was 9%. And Anthony was like, oh, I read 6.4%. So we now are spending just a really small fraction of our income on food. And it's much less, actually, than other comparable nations. Um, and so we have ideas about what food costs that are based on pretty um, perverse incentives. You know, So the way that um, our government subsidizes poor agriculture has really set us up to believe that food is cheap and should always be cheap. And you know the, the ideas that we have about how much meat costs in particular is really based on something which is um, not really defensible on any level, you know, ethically or environmentally um, or even health. Um, so I think that you know there will be a big shift and the question is, will people start seeing that fast enough for us to survive as a business? You know, because um, our ideas about these things change kind of generationally, not like in the span of a restaurant lease. So we'll see. I think that's a really great question to wrap it up. I thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. I learned a lot. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you.